It's good to be with you tonight. Well, as soon as I drove up here, the sun was setting. It was red in the west. My back home, we used to say, uh, red sky at night, sailors do not. So I guess tomorrow will be a clear day. Tonight our lesson is on uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 38 through 48, talking about the ethics of Jesus. Appreciate Brother Green reading that for us. Think about those words that we just heard from Brother Green. How those words really cut to the truth of Christian life. They are gentle, but they're revolutionary when you think about it. They're hard, as Brother Green pointed out, yet they're liberating. They're penetrating, but demanding, because they were gathered by the Son of God. What are ethics? Definition here of ethics is the system or code of morals of a particular philosopher or philosophy, religion, group, profession, etc. System or code of morals. We wanted not to talk about that. As I begin, I wanted to read, uh, as I begin, eight points here from the late Thomas B. Warren about Christian ethics. It says, number one, Christian ethics is a revealed, not a speculative ethic. John 17, verse 17, Thy word is truth, Jesus said. Number two, the Christian ethic is an absolute ethic. John 8, verse 32, You shall know the truth, the truth shall make you free. Number four, number three rather, the Christian ethic is one which involves the thoughts of the mind, or the heart, as well as the deeds of the body. Number five, the Christian ethic is one of striving for perfection. Number six, the Christian ethic is one vitally connected with the free will of man and the responsibility which accompanies such freedom. Romans 6, verse 23, the wages of sin is death. There's a price for that. Number seven, the Christian ethic is one which involves love in both directions, from God to man and from man to God. Finally, number eight, Christian ethic is one of showing mercy and kindness to one's fellow man. How true that is. For me, the Christian ethic is centers around Jesus Christ. Over in 1 Peter chapter 2, the Apostle Peter writes these words in verse 21. He says, For even here unto were ye called, because Christ also, also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow in his steps, who did no sin, neither was God found his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not but committed himself to him that judges righteousness, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you are healed. That's the ethics of Jesus Christ. So let's look at that at this, at this passage, Matthew chapter 5, verse 38 through 48. Jesus begins here, and this is going to be as much a Bible study tonight as a sermon, I would imagine. But Jesus begins by saying, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for truth. Jesus refutes the old law of retaliation that so many people in this world cling to, even some Christians. The old argument about, oh, let's get even. Genesis chapter 4, the son of Cain named Laman said unto his wives, Ada and Zillah, he says, Hear, O my voice, O wives of Laman, listen to my speech, for I have killed a man for wounding me, even a young man for hurting me. The law of retaliation. Now Jesus had come, or rather the Jews, rather had come along and perverted the law of Moses. Because when they would come along and say, oh, an eye, an eye for tooth for tooth, they meant getting even. The Lord didn't mean that. In fact, let's just read those over in Leviticus chapter 24. You can read the actual text where that came from. And it tells us in Leviticus 24 verse 19. It says, if a man cause a blemish in his neighbor, as he hath done, so shall it be done to him. Verse 20, breach for breach, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. As he hath caused a blemish in a man, so shall it be done unto him again. Now these words were not retaliation. These words, basically we would say today, let the punishment fit the crime. If someone comes and knocks out someone's tooth, he will lose a tooth. Well, you know... In, in the, uh, the ancient Jews, they came along and 
they uh, made this a law of retaliation for everyday living. You know, if someone, you know, uh, does you wrong, you hit them back hard. You get even. That's not what the Lord meant, what God meant. Notice Jesus returns to what God says about this, the original intent. But I say unto you, not the scribes and Pharisees, but I say unto you, we must not retaliate against evil done to us. Notice what he says here in verse uh, 39. Resist that ye resist not evil. American Standard Version says, Resist not him that is evil. <clears throat> and it says, Even if they come up and smite you, that was a blow to the face, to strike the face <coughs> with the palm of the hand or the clenched fist, don't retaliate. Even if it's offensive, those are hard words. Matthew chapter 26, the Lord practiced what he preached. Verse 67, we talked about this last week. When Jesus before the Sanhedrin, Jewish council, then they spat in his face and buffeted him, they smote him, and others smote him with the palms of their hands. The Lord didn't retaliate. He could, they could have all been dead like that. He retaliated, but he didn't. And you know the reaction you and I have, at least I have, Someone hits me, I hit him back. That's not what the Lord said. Jesus commands us to turn the other cheek in verse 39. Turn to him the other also. Someone hits you on the slaps you on the cheek. Self-control. Self-control. Because you recognize if you haven't done anything wrong, then any recompense, payback, comes at the hand of God. Jude verse 9. It says, Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed, uh, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. The Lord rebuke you. And you know, we should, this should cause us to think when we read these words the Lord said, Don't return evil for evil in our everyday life. Over in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 12, Apostle Paul, I think, sums this up well. That beautiful passage in verse 17, where he says, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it is possible, notice that, if it is possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place to the wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. How true that is, and how hard that is sometimes. But let's, some folks carry this maybe too far. And they say, well, we've got to be complete pacifists. You know, if, uh, you know, no, no self defense at all. I remember when I was in college many years ago, I had a Bible teacher that was a pacifist. And someone said, well, what do you do if someone attacks your family? Oh, I stand in front of them. You know, well, I think there's more to it than that. Jesus said in Luke 22, verse 36, when he was about to be betrayed and arrested. He said, But now he that hath a purse, let him take it. And he that hath script, and he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. I believe there is justification. The Bible teaches this for self-defense. Now, there's a fine line there. Retaliation and vengeance is not allowed. But self-defense, yes, is allowed. Matthew 26, verse 52 Again, when the Lord was arrested and Peter took out his sword and chopped off the guy, ear of the servant of the high priest, the Lord healed that ear. And he said, put again, he told Peter, put up again thy sword in his place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Peter, don't go on the offensive. Don't do that. Defend yourself, yes, but don't go on the offensive. Return evil for evil. We must be careful that we do know the difference in the two. 
Now look what else the ethics of Jesus shows us. In verse 40, 42, If any man will sue thee at the law, take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. Now, the ancient Jews, the men usually, they wore three basic garments. One was an inner shirt that went down to the ankles. Next to that was the coat with sleeves that also extended to the ankles. And then outside that you had a cloak or mantle, a long seamless garment, you, and sometimes the poor will use it as a, as a blanket. And uh, you know, uh, I believe it was Peter there when he was uh, in jail there in the, in the temple, the dungeon, the angel come to, told him, says, get on your mantle, come with me. Because he was probably covered up with that. Over in Exodus chapter 22, we won't read all this, verse 26, 27, uh, the law said, if a, if a poor man give you his coat, his mantle, as pledge for something, then you don't, you don't have to take, you don't take, you return it to him by the end of the day because he has to have it, to cover himself up some way at night. That aside, this may well refer, probably does refer to litigation, to law, and he's basically saying here, don't fret yourself over physical possessions. If any man hath sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. Now I know, brethren, you probably do too, they get very upset about if someone, and who would get upset if someone sues them or something like that, obviously, but they, oh my. But what did, what did Paul say over in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 7? Now therefore there is utterly a fault among you because you go to law one with another. Why not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? That's an interesting verse. And I believe that ties in here what we just read in verse 40 of Matthew chapter 5. Again, trying, wouldn't society be so much better if we didn't have all this litigation, all this people going to court against each other every time you turn around you hear about things like that and he says maybe it should be should take fault now, does that mean that we should again not be a patsy or something and someone take advantage of us but there are situations where that apply but notice in verse 41 also this ties in with this idea as well whoever shall compare thee to go a mile go with him twain or two of course Ancient Israel was an occupied country, occupied by the, by the Roman Empire. And they had their soldiers there. And let me tell you, their soldiers were a rough bunch. They were from all over the world. They were rough. And the law, Roman law, said you could require a person to carry your gear, and they carried gear around. When they, were, they marched for miles and miles and miles. But, uh, and, but say, if you, your gear, you could require someone to carry that for you for a mile. And then you get somebody else carried for you for a mile. Well, you can imagine how the Jews deeply resented that. Here was this pagan, this heathen, occupying my country and requiring me to carry his, his pack or whatever as he's marching along. Jesus says, don't do that. He's saying, in essence here, better to serve him than to serve your own pride and your own vengeance, which they were eat up with pride and vengeance, as you can read in the Gospel accounts. We need to think about it today, too. Do we cheerfully serve others? Do we get all upset? Or do we try to serve other people? Who serves you? Compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Verse 42. Give to him that asketh thee. From him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. The habit of giving. Brethren, we need to be a generous people. Why? Because God has been generous to us. Matthew 25, verse 40, the great parable of the, the Lord separates the sheep from the goats, the judgment day. The king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, As much as you have done it unto one of these, least these my brethren, you have done it unto me. We should be generous. Help people out. Now, does that apply to the drug abuser? The alcoholic? 
professional panhandler, the lazy folks. Saw a guy at Walmart the other day on the corner. I don't know what his situation, but he had a sign there. I saw him there for about two weeks. Family of five to feed. And he quoted some scripture down there. Now, I don't know who he is, but I have heard quite a few times that some of those people make more money than you in a day than you and I make in a week from people giving them things, being generous. What did the Apostle Paul say? Knowing full well what the Lord had said here about, about being, being generous in verse 43, verse 42, he said, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any should not work, neither should he eat. Now, a lot of our own brethren would say that was heartless. But that's what Paul said. Because Paul knew the difference between generosity and and being taken advantage of. And I think that's something we need to think about in our ethics. But Jesus also goes forward and, 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 and refutes an idea they had about love. And many people to this day have a convoluted ideas about love. And look at verse 43. You have heard it said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless those that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which sight for you and persecute you. Now, the first thing we need to look at that is Christian should hate some things. That's not saying there in that verse, oh, you don't hate anything. Any, you don't hate anything. No, we should hate wickedness, shouldn't we? We should hate sin. We should hate false doctrine. Psalm 119, verse 104, Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false day. Wait. You can read on the book of Matthew. I believe it's Matthew 24. 23, where Jesus just blessed out the scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, what he said. But some folks today would say, oh, that's, that's not being loving. But the ancient Jews had taken the law of Moses and twisted it. What did the law say? Let's look over in Exodus chapter 23. The more I read about the law of Moses, the more I appreciate it. Because it was a wonderful, just thing. In, in, uh, in, not Genesis, Exodus 23, verse 4 and 5. Exodus 23, verse 4 and 5. It says here, Neither shalt thou uh, countenance a poor man in his cause, if thou, uh, if thou meet thine enemy's ox or his ass going astray, thou shalt surely bring it back to him. If thou see the ass of him who hateth thee lying under his burden, and wouldst forbear to help him, thou shalt surely help him. Now, what is that? That's loving your neighbor. Isn't it? And he, they were saying, he was saying, if you see your bitterest enemy out there, and his animal, and you know, no one sees this but you and the animal, you help that animal. You get it back to your enemy. And that's what Jesus is saying here in these verses. Uh, who sir, that give to him, or rather, verse 43, you've heard it said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. You know, for many people, love is complacency. They don't want to do anything. They want to, don't want to rebuke anyone. They don't want to call anybody on carpet, so to speak. Kind of way they don't want to do any of that because that's not loving. Let's just overlook all that. Let's just act like we don't see that. And what that's doing is approving of that person's conduct. But Christian love does not approve of another's conduct. But they also wish them well too. They will reprove them and rebuke them, exhort them, but they want the best for them. As I mentioned in Luke 22, what did the Lord do when that Man came to arrest him, and, and uh, here Peter lops off his ear. The Lord heals the ear of his probably his worst enemy, which was the priest, high priest, his servant. And he healed his ear. That is an amazing thing when you read about that. Luke chapter 22. And then he clears it up why the Jews had taken this law and twisted, oh, you've got to hate your enemy and love your fellow Jew. 
What does he say in verse 44? But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you. The peacemaker. Christian love. The love of Jesus love one's enemies. In uh, verse 44, it says, bless them that curse you. American Standard says, pray for them that curse you. Don't curse them back. You pray for them or you bless them. That's what Jesus did. You know, when Jesus was on the cross between the two thieves, at least at first, they were cursing him. Why don't you get us down from this cross? Now, one came around. But the Lord just didn't say, that's it. Curse them back. He didn't, did he? Do good, he says. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them that despitefully use you. Do good. That's an active love. Instead of hating someone, you actively love them. What did Jesus do when He was on the cross? He prayed to the Father that those who crucified Him might be forgiven if they repented. Father, forgive them and know what, not what they do. He wants us to be good to our friends and make friends of our enemies. Wouldn't the world be a different place if that was the case? Pray for those, He says in verse 44. Pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. Think of the word despitefully. That means unjust, shameful words and deeds. There the Lord was on the cross, bleeding from every pore in His body almost, beaten, battered, humiliated. And up comes some of the priests and scribes Verse 27, uh, verse, uh, chapter 27 of Matthew, verse 39. As they passed by, they railed on him. means over and over again. Wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself if thou art the Son of God. Come down from the cross. That's just being despitefully used. Right there. Unkind is cut of all. That's the way people are today, too. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Verse 13, but evil men and imposters, seducers rather, shall wax worse and worse, Paul said, deceiving and being deceived. The Lord wants us to love our enemies and don't return evil for evil. Then the Lord's ethics would come to verse 45. The why. The why of all this that ye may be children of your Father which is in heaven. The goal, the goal is to become more like God, to surrender our will to His will. That's what Jesus did. John 6, verse 38. He said, I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of Him who sent me. Shouldn't it be that, that way with us too? Should we surrender our will to God's will? God's love is not selfish love or love for his own benefit is it look in verse 46 for if you love them that love you what reward have you do not even the publicans the same the publicans were the tax collectors the collaborators with the romans you say they, they love each other too say so think about what god does god loves us even when we are in rebellion, utter and complete rebellion against Him. People out there in the world that do a horrible things, use God's name in vain, every other sentence, and mistreat others whom God created in His own image, and on and on we could go, and yet God still loves them. He wants the best for them. He wants them to repent. He wants all people to move towards Him. Acts 17, verse 27, Paul said that they may seek the Lord if happily they might feel after Him and find Him, though He be not far from every one of us. What about human love? Human love is often selfish, verse 47. And if you salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans do that? Do so. We're only friendly with help and helpful to those who, are, who benefit us. Why not be friendly and helpful to those that won't benefit us? The 
Christian's aim should be to work towards perfection, completeness. Notice 48. Be thou therefore perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect, complete, mature. Loving others as God has loved us. 1 Peter 3, verse 9. Not rendering evil for evil, or railing for railing, but contrawise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called that you may inherit a blessing. What a wonderful thought. Our aim should be towards completeness. We never reach that completeness, do we? But we aim towards it. Is that our aim? Is that my aim? With Apostle Paul's. Think of all the Apostle Paul had been in his life. A probably a pretty wealthy man at one time. Highly respected, highly educated, powerful man. Persecuted the church. Had people tortured. And then it tells us he became a Christian. And Paul wrote in Philippians 3, verse 12. He says, Brethren, I count not myself to apprehend it. I have not made it. Even though he was an apostle, the Lord had appeared to him. I'm not apprehended, but these th one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press towards the mark, the prize, the high calling of, Christ Je of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, as many of you as be, as many as be perfect or mature, be thus minded. And if anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal it unto you. Beautiful that thought was. You think about it. There may be someone here tonight who has not surrendered to the Lord and become a Christian. Obey God's plan of salvation to believe the Word of God. Hear that Word and believe it. To repent of their sins. To confess Jesus for men to be baptized, immersed in water for the mission of those sins. Rise up to walk in newness of life. Aim towards completeness. Have the ethics of Jesus Christ. If this is your need tonight, please come as we stand and sing. <clears throat> Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved.